afternoon, Fiskarma, and welcome to the Justice Subcommittee and Policing second meeting of 2018. We have no apologies. Um, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Um, um, it's a discussion on the subcommittee's work programme. Are members agreed to that? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. The second item is undercover uh, policing, um, and it's an evidence session from Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland's report on its restricted review of undercover policing in Scotland. I would refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a, a private paper. Uh, I welcome to the meeting this afternoon uh, Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, <coughs> Ian Kernaghan, Organised Crime Unit, and Graham Walsh, Organised Crime Unit at the Scottish Government, Derek Penman, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, and Stephen Whitelock, the Lead Inspector, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, to the meeting. Um, now, I would invite the Cabinet Secretary, uh, if you wish, Cabinet Secretary, to make a, a, an opening statement of perhaps up to three minutes, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm grateful to Derek Penman and his team for delivering their strategic review of undercover policing in Scotland, which I received on the 2nd of November. The review provides reassurance to the public and to this Parliament around the extent and scale of the use of undercover police officers since 2000, identifies room for improvement and makes a number of recommendations that Police Scotland has committed to implement in full. I have taken my time to consider carefully this detailed and comprehensive report with a view to making a decision on the matter of a public inquiry in Scotland. As I mentioned in my statement yesterday, uh, the Scottish Government is currently being judicially reviewed on the issue of not having held a public inquiry in Scotland. This has also had a bearing on the time I have taken to consider the report. The ongoing legal proceedings with regards to the judicial review constrain what I can say in direct relation to that issue, but I will try to be helpful to the committee as I can. I set out my reasoning yesterday on my decision not to hold a separate Scottish inquiry and did so in some detail. I know that others will take a different view uh, to mine and I respect those views, but I have taken this decision on the basis of all of the information that is available to me. Uh, there, are, there is a lack of evidence of any systemic failings within undercover policing in Scotland and in light of the limited scale of the activities of SDES and NPOIU police officers in Scotland, I believe setting up a further inquiry would not be a proportionate response. I believe such an inquiry would inevitably create a measure of duplication with the undercover policing inquiry by involving many of the same core participants, law enforcement officers, and has the potential to overlap in its conclusions and remedies. It could, because of the scale and duration of the undercover policing inquiry, be subject to potential delay in obtaining Metropolitan Police Service participation and documentation and would be disproportionate in terms of costs. Uh, other uh, positions remain, our position remains that the clearest and most effective way of addressing concerns about what may have happened in Scotland as a result of English and Welsh police forces is for the terms of reference of the undercover police inquiry to be amended to allow it to look at the activity of English and Welsh police operations, which took place across Great Britain. And that is why I wrote again yesterday to the Home Secretary to ask her to reconsider those terms of reference. I have genuine sympathy for the individuals if they have suffered due to the actions of undercover police officers who have behaved in ways that are unethical and unacceptable. But I am clear that behaviours by police officers, in particular, in particular English and Welsh units, is properly a matter for the Home Secretary. Police Scotland has established a steering group chaired by the Assistant Chief Constable Steve Johnston to oversee delivery of the 19 recommendations made in the report, and HMICS are represented on that group to provide advice and context behind each recommendation. I am happy to repeat the assurance I gave to Parliament yesterday that any recommendations arising from the undercover policing inquiry will be considered and, where appropriate and necessary, implemented. And should new information or evidence become available in due course, particularly through the undercover policing inquiry, I will give it careful consideration and, if appropriate, revisit the possibility of an inquiry. Thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Mr Penn, would you like to make some opening remarks, please? Yes, I thank you. Vener, thank you. I, too, am grateful to the committee for providing me with an opportunity to give evidence on my strategic review of undercover policing in Scotland. As you're aware, undercover policing raises complex ethical questions and there has been legitimate public and political concern over its use in the past. It must be tightly controlled in accordance with the law, with effective safeguards and robust supervision in place at all times. 
My statutory function is to inquire into the state effectiveness and efficiency of Police Scotland, and the terms of reference for this report has primarily focused on providing assurance to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and this Parliament that effective safeguards are currently in place in Scotland to mitigate against unethical behaviours and that undercover policing operations by Police Scotland can be conducted lawfully and with sufficient oversight and scrutiny. I have made 19 recommendations which I believe will drive improvement within Police Scotland. Some of these will also require engagement with other agencies and should drive improvement under cover policing across the United Kingdom. My report also examines the extent and scale of undercover policing operations carried out in Scotland since the introduction of RIPSA in 2000. This includes operations conducted by legacy police forces across Scotland and notably those operations conducted by the Special Demonstration Squad and the National Public Order Intelligence Unit for the same period. While I have been able to provide information on the number of operations conducted and at a level of detail not previously made public, I have not reviewed these operations. In terms of the information about the SDS and NPOIU, this was provided by Operation Hearn and the National Police Chiefs Council. This has been identified from the substantial amount of information being collated as part of their obligations to provide information to the undercover policing inquiry currently being conducted in England and Wales. Having conducted this review, I conclude that the use of undercover officers is lawful and the legitimate way of tackling the threats from serious organised crime, cyber and terrorism. The officers who undertake this function volunteer for the role, often placing them in a challenging and occasionally dangerous situation, a role for which they receive little or no recognition. I have been careful in my report not to compromise the operational integrity of the tactic, and I am sure members will understand that in my evidence today, I will be unable to answer any questions that may, be, that may identify undercover officers or disclose covert policing tactics. If I could finish by emphasising my own view that there can be no place in modern policing which relies on legitimacy and public consent for the unethical behaviours from undercover police officers that have been identified through previous reports published in England and Wales. I sympathise with those who have suffered from this and I understand their need for justice. The activities of those undercover officers from SDS and NPOIU whilst operating in Scotland was part of wider oper undercover operations being conducted across Great Britain. The responsibility for the management and supervision of these operations lay out with policing in Scotland. In my opinion, they are inextricably linked to the matters being considered by the undercover policing inquiry in England and Wales. It would therefore seem appropriate to me that those who have suffered as a result of these operations in Scotland should have some form of redress through the undercover police inquiry. Thank you, Mr Penman. Uh, it's now open to members for questions. Stuart. Thank you very much. Um, I asked the Cabinet Secretary a question yesterday in relation to uh, securing uh, uh, and protecting information, and uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, assured me that uh, we met all the legal requirements, and I accept that unreservedly. I, I just want to look forward perhaps rather than backward. I, I'm looking at recommendations 18, 14 that I talked to the Cabinet Secretary yesterday, but it would also include 16, uh, which is about a record management system. And I really just wonder whether, given the extraordinary sensitivity of information in this area and the potential life-threatening consequences of unauthorised uh, unplanned disclosures in relation to individual uh, officers, uh, whether it may be time to uh, look at how we store and how we provide access to officers who have operational needs to get that access. And I, I, I'm not going to go into any sort of detail, but I come from an, an, a, a banking environment where, in many instances, no single person could ever do certain things. And I just wonder whether um, there are examples in other industries, and maybe it's already used in the police, and I don't want any operational material to be compromised by answers, uh, whether there is scope for looking at further protecting the information uh, that it is necessary, of course, uh, to hold, and making sure that we understand who has access to information, who has had access to information, so that we can make sure that in the future we continue to protect these very precious but also very vulnerable assets. The point you make is, uh, is incredibly valid. The, the, the type of information or intelligence that is gathered in these operations is highly sensitive and obviously has uh, um, the, the potential to identify sources and put them at risk. 
what we have done is made recommendations within our report that there should be a single system that would m maintain and manage all of the authorisations, but would also manage all of the information and intelligence that would flow from that. Um, we've also made recommendations for Police Scotland about, in terms of the officers who are in the field, be able to gather and collect that information on secure laptops effectively. So th there are already robust processes in place within Police Scotland um, for the secure data. There are confidential networks that are locked above a level that other people can access and there are also auditing functions that are available within that. What our report does is to, to ask them effectively to collate that and to go further and bring it all into one um, specific system. But the point you make around the security of information is well made. Um, I, I'll, I'll just ask one further thing because I don't want to bog us down on this to, to any great extent. Um, absolutely accept seniority has to be associated with access but equally uh, my own experience in other domains is that uh, seniority alone is not enough in the sense that if it is necessary for two people to come, to come along with a key issue for the sake of argument that actually protects those people as well because it secures access in a particular way and I just think there are it goes back a long way in quite primitive ways and nowadays is quite sophisticated. Uh, whether it, I don't think for, it's for the inspector, of course, to go and do this. Um, I'm merely encouraging the inspector to encourage uh, others in the Scottish Police Authority and who have responsibilities yeah. here Wait. to look further at that particular process. I mean, if I can re reassure you, the system's in place where, even regardless of rank, actually, some senior officers will be unable to access that material. It's yeah. very role-specific. The systems require the officers to basically log on and access them. There'll be systems that the system will be capable of auditing the access to that information. And I think I'm right in saying even the assistant chief constable who's authorising them must do that on the computer system. So it provides that audit trail um, going through. So the, the, the system, um, so those who are allowed access is strictly controlled and their access is monitored as part of the process. I'm grateful, Convener. Margaret. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, could I ask Mr. Perman, perhaps, you mentioned your opening statement that undercover policing um, should be robust, the supervision should be robust, as should be the authorisation progress. In Recommendation 9, you um, say that there should be an, uh, a results analysis that demonstrates the impact of undercover um, policing should be introduced and, and also that Police Scotland should engage with the College of Policing and progress a self-assessment of the authorisation, governance and tactical management arrangements for undercover policing um, as part of a formal national accreditation. Could you elaborate on, on so, why these right? Yeah, but certainly in terms of the processes being robust, they'll be drawn from the legislation primarily and then the statutory guidance and then the authorised professional practice, which is effectively the doctrine of guidance advice that's pulled together by policing across the United Kingdom, almost for practitioners and how they would operate um, that. So what we in our report are, are, are encouraging Police Scotland to do, and they do it, is to be making sure that they follow not only the legislation and the statutory guidance, but also the approved professional practice uh, in relation to that. And that, if you like, provides this, you know, that everyone is operating to um, the same standards across the country in a way that everybody understands and is accountable. The recommendation nine actually around the, um, looking at the, the results analysis, it was actually a recommendation more intended to say that once undercover policing tactic has been used, it would be sensible for Police Scotland to evaluate its use, almost in a kind of operational benefit, cost benefit. So having used the tactic, what did they get from that? Was it a good use of police resources, a good use of, um, of money, to be honest uh, with there? And what did they learn from that that they could then roll over into future operations? Okay, well, that brings me on to the financial recommendation 17 that the Scotland should strengthen the financial management of covert accounts and introduce independent financial audit regime with improved um, reporting, perhaps, if you could indicate why, and maybe the Cabinet Secretary could um, respond to that recommendation. Yeah, but indeed, again, um, because the nature of this business um, it requires to be funded, so the covert activity requires to be funded, um, as you can imagine, um, and if the, if the officers who are undercover are spending money, that has to be accounted for. What we were keen to do, and although we did do an audit and everything was accounted for, what we felt is there could be greater detail uh, in terms of you know, what receipts and things provided for. 
Our rationale behind that simply is if there's detail provided within the receipts for almost for every pound that is spent, it does give a fairly good picture, detailed picture of about what undercover officers are spending money on. And provided that that's been done by someone who's suitably vetted and secure, you can then start to you know, almost make sure that when people are not being supervised all the time, what the money's been spent on is accounted for. And it does give an additional safeguard to officers' integrity and their ethical behaviour. Okay. Cabinet Secretary. I don't know if I can add anything further to what uh, the Chief Inspector has mentioned, because it's largely an operational matter for Police Scotland to take forward, other than that it would seem to me that it's a very practical measure they should put in place, and it would provide that ad additional assurance in our audit trail. And um, it, as I mentioned yesterday in my statement, Police Scotland have accepted all 19 of the recommendations and will be taking them uh, forward, which uh, HMICS will be engaging with them in the process of ensuring that happens. Mentioned, Cabinet Secretary, it's an operational matter. Um, could you indicate the financial management of undercover operations? If it, require, it does require uh, more oversight. It, can we expand on that? If it's either the Cabinet Secretary or the, um, the Inspector, is, is there an oversight role for the SPA, for example? If I, if I, I, yes, I think we've made, we've made some um, recommendations that include the uh, police authority and their ability to provide scrutiny over um, covert activity um, from that. It's inherently difficult to do some of that, as you can imagine, publicly, but there, there is a need. There's a need to account for the use of the resource and the use of the money. Um, what we also said in our report, though, is about, I suppose, the, the, the authority being able to provide to receive some assurance that this work has been undertaken ethically. Um, so I, I definitely believe there's a role for the authority that probably has to be further developed about how they can be reassured or assured that the money's been spent properly and the tactic's been used effectively. And in fairness, though, this tactic is also um, regulated by the Office of Surveillance Commissioners who have got a statutory function who come in and examine this in detail. But I think on the wider question about um, is this tactic a good use of public money, is it being dealt done properly, and also um, is it being accounted for, are all relevant for the authority. Before I bring Rona in, can I maybe just clarify something with you, Mr Penman? It is about the practicalities. Everyone wants public money to be accounted for, but I'm conscious that an undercover officer, it might indeed look suspicious asking for a receipt. I mean, I presume there's a measure of latitude among that to ensure that no one's compromised as a result of... No, this absolutely. Process. I think there has to be common sense in, in, in all of this. And, you know, I say probably in my statement, accounting for every pound is perhaps too dramatic um, a statement. I think it's just about being able to account for the money that has been made from that. But again, I would still expect you know, if no receipts are there, you would still expect a discussion between an undercover officer and the, and the cover officer who's looking after his welfare to be able to account for the money that has been that has been spent um, in that way. And again, there'll be other other things will support whether that's reasonable or otherwise. Okay, thank you very much, David. Rona. Thank you, convener. Good afternoon. Um, can I ask you about the use of undercover policing in Scotland and, and the level of that? Um, your report states that the capacity and capability um, within Police Scotland to conduct undercover policing is uh, currently limited and uh, needs to be further developed. And I wonder if you could expand on that and link into that the level of undercover policing now with the single force as to previously, and, and if, if things, operations have changed? Yeah, I mean, we've provided the, the, the numbers in, um, in the report, and if you want more, I mean, <coughs> Stephen can provide the detail. I mean, this was in broad terms that what we saw in terms of Police Scotland has been very limited use of the tactic. There was probably greater use of it um, within the legacy forces, although perhaps still not a great deal of use in Scotland. There was perhaps more in legacy forces than there has been within Police Scotland um, in relation to that. In some respects, we were reassured by that because after the 2014 HMIC report in England and Wales, we actually wrote to Police Scotland and met with them uh, around picking up on the, the learning from the report in England and Wales. Um, and I think that encouraged them to look at what their operation was across Scotland and to start putting the safeguards and building the capability and capacity in order to support those undercover operations. Uh, our concern would have been had they had lots of undercover operatives out but not having the back office to support them. So what we've, we've seen is Police Scotland actually looking to bring the legacy practices together and then starting to develop and improve them. And I think they're now in a position where they can start to scale that up. There's also the, the, the changing um, crime and demands on, on policing. So what we found, as you've seen from a report, that uh, all the activity, including legacy forces, was directed towards serious organised crime. Um, from there. What we're seeing is a change in crime now and a certain move towards internet related crime and paedophile activity uh, and, and other things where we think there's greater capacity now for Police Scotland to invest on the undercover online function, mm -hmm. um, which again I think would be, would be particularly fruitful. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, Liam and Ben had supplementaries on this point. Yeah. Uh, this issue. Good afternoon. Um, I, I was interested in the point around um, capacity and, and capability because it's obviously an operational matter. It's not been raised by Police Scotland that they didn't feel they had the resources or needed to skill up in order to, um, uh, to, to, to carry out more undercover activity. And therefore, um, I suppose it would be interesting to understand why it is that this has emerged as a recommendation through, through this review when it hasn't been flagged up as an issue, other than the issues around um, online uh, crime and, and, and whatnot, in the generality, is an area where Police Scotland have, have made very clear that um, additional resources will need to go, uh, need to be committed going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, although perhaps there's no visibility, I think Police Scotland themselves, certainly in our field, what recommended it, it, it recognised that it was a tactic that more use could be made of, but they didn't, they didn't have themselves the capability capacity. So, for example, one of our recommendations was to have a full-time com UC. It's a, it's a technical role that's dedicated to looking after the undercover policing facility. That wasn't a full-time post, and they themselves recognised that that needed to be um, to be developed. So I, I think they themselves recognised the need to increase the capability and capacity of the tactic. The, the online one, I think, is, is the one in particular that would require more work. But what, our first recommendation, though, effectively, is a more strategic um, recommendation to say, Police Scotland really need to consider covert policing in the round and consider what is it they need to tackle the crime um, and other problems that they would deal with in Scotland and actually start to scale up in size it accordingly. So our first recommendation is very much to Police Scotland to say, you know, you need to look at where they see their need for undercover policing uh, online in particular and then start to size up and build that capability and capacity. So what you're saying is that effectively the, the relatively low level of usage in, in Scotland is, is partially a reflection of a lack of capacity and capability rather than a, um, a, 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 a recognition that, um, uh, or a, a, a view within Police Scotland that um, it wasn't necessarily relevant or appropriate to the, the, the I mean, the, the I, I, I mean, I think the, num the numbers, as you'll see, are very low. I, I imagine the numbers will still, will still be relatively low. You know, we're not shouting for an exponential in increase. I mean, I think what we're saying to Police Scotland is they need to understand themselves, I think, through their strategic threat assessment of policing more generally, what do they need in, in terms of undercover capability? And actually, they need to start developing that capability once they understand what it is they're trying to do. That will be online. It will also be about serious organised crime uh, as well. From that, so and part of the 2026 policing strategies you'll be aware of is looking into what are these new threats and, and, and what, what is the new shape of policing going to be like. And I suppose if you take policing as a cake, what size of the cake comes to specialist operations and covert policing? And, and just finally, sorry, Kamina, if there's an expectation that um, the level of undercover activity is likely to increase um, for the reasons you've suggested, is there also an expectation that the way in which that's um, carried out and the oversight and the regulation of it um, takes place, will need to adapt to reflect the, the, the higher degree to which it's been carried out? That's exactly, I think, the, the, the point in our report about, you, you know, you, you can't increase the number of undercover officers without having a commensurate increase in the back office support for all of that to ensure that the safety of the officers, integrity, and you know, the ethical standards and how the, the, the tactic has been delivered. Um, around that, but it's also where the undercover policing bit fits into more generally, um, you know, the major crime inquiries as well. So it, it's about how everything fits together. What do police Scotland need for the future, and then start to build that? It's what we're seeing in the report. I think I was, I mean, I, that except I, I was thinking more along the lines of, of whether or not, in terms of transparency, would be the wrong the the, the, the wrong um, expression, but. Um, an oversight of, of that, if it's a larger component of what Police Scotland are, are doing, I suppose there'd be a, 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 a public e expectation that it's being carried out um, according to um, fairly well established uh, rules so, and, and how that, that reassurance can be provided is perhaps going to be different in future than it is currently. Yeah, no, absolutely, and, and that will that, that, come from, as I say, the legislation controls that, the guidance controls that, there's the, the role of um, the surveillance commissioners in inspecting how that work's taken out uh, as well. So there is a whole framework. What we're also um, you know, being clear is that Police Scotland should also join the accreditation um, that will be run by National Police Chiefs Council, so it will provide another level of safeguard and assurance around how the whole tactic is operated and, and, and how it's worked. Mm -hmm. Maybe just worth pointing out, there has been some changes around the governance already, so a combination of the legislation and the codes of practice that go alongside the regulation for investigatory powers act in Scotland, but also the 
Office of the Surveillance Commissioner, who were previously responsible for monitoring and assessing compliance with the legislation within, uh, uh, within bodies that had the ability to undertake surveillance operations, has now been consolidated into the Investigative Powers uh, Commissioner uh, Office, which has brought together um, a number of the, um, uh, the oversight bodies into one single body. But it, you still have the, the tribunal system there for people who feel there's been breaches. So, uh, uh, there is changes already taking place uh, and uh, around the oversight function and how how uh, a, a force such as Police Scotland uh, will be inspected and how they'll be held to account and evaluated and how they're utilising these types of powers under the legislation and the codes of practice as well. Thank you. I have brief supplementaries from Ben and Stuart and then Daniel. Thank you. Convener. Very briefly, as, as Ron and Liam have covered much of what I was going to ask, but I, I just wanted to I uh, appreciate the point about that undercover online activity is, is potentially an, an area where, where more capability and capacity will be required. But I note that in, in recent months there has been significant progress in terms of uh, significant prosecutions for organised crime. And I wondered if throughout the process of, 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 of the report, uh, make, uh, producing the report and, and the research around it, how pertinent is undercover policing to taking forward that shared responsibility to, to tackle organised crime? I mean, I think we've said it, it's, it's a legitimate, it's another tool in the toolbox, it's a legitimate tactic um, that can be used and it can be used to good effect, I think would be our take on it. What we feel is that Police Scotland's current use of it uh, is very limited and it, there's you know, the opportunity to, to make more of it to tackle um, those people who cause the greatest threat, harm and risk to communities of Scotland, so serious organised crime, sex offenders um, and others, those online and I say those, those other uh, crime groups as well. So our view is it's a legitimate tactic and more can be made, for, made of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just occurred to me there is a, another question where we're talking about uh, online embedding. There is not necessarily a physical contact between uh, Police Scotland's uh, staff and the potential criminals. Uh, but in particular, given the very specialist skills that are required in certain areas online, are there actually people who are not police constables involved in this? In other words, civilians employed who are part of the uh, covert operations? And if so, are there special arrangements that relate to them? I mean, certainly those who are involved in the undercover online officers have a specific qualification, but perhaps I could pass over to, to Stephen. Uh, yeah, no, everybody involved in undercover uh, are police officers, uh, sworn officers and constables uh, in relation to that and go through the, the training course in relation to it. Uh, some bring specialist skills in terms of their, their, their digital awareness in the world of the, the World Wide Web, etc. Uh, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask a, a couple of questions of Mr. Uh, uh, of, uh, Chief Inspector Penman regarding the scope of his work before uh, asking the, the Cabinet Secretary about next steps. So on page four of the review, we, it, you state that we established that there was no evidence that undercover advanced officers from Police Scotland had infiltrated social justice campaigns or that officers had operated out with the parameters of the authorisation. Can I just clarify, did you establish whether that was also true of the, the legacy forces. And likewise, can I just ask uh, whether it's correct to state that uh, the, the situation pre-2000 was not within the scope of your review? The, 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 the date that we, we um, were working to was effectively RIPSA, where we'd have expected the, the document sets and things to be available from that. Um, so it seemed a logical time when was this Parliament passed the legislation and you're interested in that, it was a good time for us to take and move forward. What we did in terms of police, uh, legacy police forces is, uh, I, I made reference earlier about we wrote to Police Scotland after the 2014 um, HMIC inquiry down south, and what we asked Police Scotland at that time to do was to start collecting and collating their information on legacy forces, because to be blunt, I had a view that I thought it would be required for the undercover policing inquiry, and I felt it was helpful for Police Scotland to start a piece of work to pull all that together. They had been working on 18 months pulling together all of the legacy force material um, at the point we came to do our review. So we were then able to examine that material and all the authorisations that were contained okay. within that. And from there, we were able to say um, definitively that all of that activity in legacy police forces in Scotland pertained to serious organised crime. Um, and not uh, to social justice campaigns. In terms of Police Scotland's work, we went into that uh, in, in detail, looking not only the authorisations, but also looking at all of the support and information that went yeah. behind that as well. I understand that. Um, 
again, your report goes into some detail re regarding the, the welfare of office, offices and how that is uh, looked after. Did your review uh, look at, or did you, uh, was it occur to you to look at the welfare of those who've been targeted by undercover offices, and indeed those who uh, may be associated with them, you know, family members uh, and, and so on? I mean, I suppose, at first point, it's inherently difficult to do that on the basis it's undercover policing tactic, and those who will have been in contact with undercover police officers, by definition, would not necessarily know they have been in contact with those officers in terms of serious sure. organised crime. So to go and actually have conversations with those people and identify them would, would be, would be um, uh, un un unnecessary. Um, what we did do in our, uh, it wasn't within the scope of our review, we did make a statement to say that we would be quite keen to speak to anybody who had anything to say to us, so anybody who had been involved or considered themselves to have been a victim of undercover policing, uh, we were quite keen for them to come forward and engage mm -hmm. with us. That offer was made, but nobody came forward um, with that. Okay. So, so Cabinet Secretary, I mean, just following on from, from those, I, mean, I think we, we, we've heard that clearly the, the scope w was set out and that, that obviously limits things, and it's a, it's a very thorough report, but it obviously has, is limited by its scope. But secondly, I mean, you acknowledged uh, yesterday that the, the, between the, the, the scope of, of this and the limitations of the inquiry that's being carried at UK level, there is therefore going to be a, a, a number of situations or circumstances which essentially will fall between the scope of the work that Mr Penman has carried out and the scope of, of, of the inquiry, whether that's regarding timeline, acts carried out by forces other than those in, in Scotland. And indeed, I think there are, you know, if we've just established here, there, there may be aspects of this which, you know, could you, now I understand what you've said about uh, a separate Scottish inquiry, but are there other ways that perhaps um, these questions could be clarified, could be looked into, other than an inquiry, should your request for the, the UK inquiry scope to be expanded? I suppose it depends on what those issues are. If there were specific concerns about undercover policing that uh, individuals had, that they had identified, that they had concerns about at a specific time, uh, that they believe that the uh, <clears throat> review which has been undertaken by the HMICS has not covered, uh, then uh, clearly that's a matter that could be considered. So if there was, as I said, if there was new evidence um, uh, that would uh, that merited giving further consideration to the matter, then I, I would certainly do that. So I think in short, my answer is that, you know, I'm not close to, if there are concerns or issues being raised or highlighted to me, that they shouldn't be considered. But as I also said yesterday, there is also another route for those who do have concerns, and that is the way in which the Investigatory Powers Tribunal operates, and that they can, uh, that people can take the, their case and their issues up through that particular process, which can allow it to be investigated, and they can go to a tribunal for consideration. I, I guess my concern with that response m might be this, is that I mean, given the nature of what we're talking about, that, that taking a passive response and sort of waiting for people to come forward, um, I think there may be good reason to, to uh, believe that, that those who might feel that they're victims might, might be reluctant to do so. And I'm just wondering whether or not there are, there are more proactive steps rather than simply waiting to see if, if cases come forward um, that could be taken. You know, could we proactively uh, seek to investigate whether or not those who have been targeted and indeed those associated with those who have been targeted uh, might have been, feel that they've been victimised? Or indeed, while it's perfectly possible that officers have conducted themselves within accordance with, with regulation, but nonetheless, the impact in terms of uh, the personal impact on those people might not be something that would be uh, satisfactory in a sort of common sense way. Well, I think it's worth keeping in mind um, it, how the inquiry in England and Wales came about. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there's a significant history to this. Uh, so the uh, first element of it was back in 2012 with the HMIC a report looking at the actions of the special demonstration squad. Uh, which highlighted concerns about the way in which they had been behaving, the way in which they'd been operating. There was then the uh, review commissioned by the then Home Secretary into allegations relating to uh, conduct around undercover operations uh, uh, with the Stephen Lawrence investigation. Uh, and then there was also the HMICS, uh, the HMIC uh, report in 2014. Uh, for England and Wales again, which highlighted issues, uh, serious concerns about the way in which 
uh, 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 undercover policing was operating in England and Wales. What we have from this review is assurances around the processes that we have in Scotland and how they have been operating. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to keep in mind is that the inquiry in England and Wales has not come about on the basis of, well, let's just look to see if there are problems. It has come about because significant problems were identified, uh, some of which involved unethical and unacceptable <coughs> behaviour amongst uh, uh, some undercover uh, officers. So there was a very strong, considerable evidence base to justify that uh, decision. Uh, what I haven't had uh, uh, to date is uh, a level of evidence or information that would suggest that there is a similar problem here in Scotland. In fact, the HMICF review it gives us assurance that that's not the case. So, come back to the point I was making earlier on, is that if it issues of concern, for example, it could be for the investigatory, it could be for the uh, investigatory appeals commissioner in reviewing conduct within policing in Scotland at some point. If they highlight concerns, then they can pursue that with uh, Police Scotland. They can, of course, raise it with government as well. Uh, but if there was specific information uh, that would it suggest to me that there is justification for further investigation, I would, of course, look at that uh, and take that into account. But I think it's extremely important to recognise the history as to how they got to having a public inquiry in England and Wales is, very, is based on very considerable evidence of concerns about how undercover policing was operating in England and Wales and how some of these specific units were operating as well. So, I mean, just very specifically on that point, so if your request is denied, there then is the very real possibility that units that we know uh, carried out these things, who, who, who behaved unethically, where they have operated in Scotland, th those cases are sim sim simply going to be kind of left in the gap between the work that's been carried out here and, and the inquiry. Is that, is that not the case if your request is denied? Well, I think, I think if, if you look at, as I, as I said out yesterday as well, is that the operation of these uh, two units, so let's take the two specific units um, uh, that we referred to in, uh, I referred to in my statement yesterday. They were UK uh, based, they were based in the Metropolitan Police, uh, national units. Uh, the, uh, uh, the evidence that we have uh, to date uh, in relation to the SDS is as complete as we expect to be. And HMICS can tell you a bit more about that, how complete that information is mm -hmm. um, as well. Uh, and also the uh, uh, evidence we have around the uh, activities of the, uh, the, the, the National Public Order uh, Intelligence Unit as well is as up-to-date as we can at the present moment, although it may be that as further information becomes available in the future. These operations uh, were based on uh, it, 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 operations take, uh, taking place across the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, their origins were in England and Wales, yes. uh, and part of it brought them into Scotland. They weren't specific Scottish operations. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't uh, being brought in by police, uh, policing in Scotland to carry out specific operations as such. Uh, as we can see, uh, with the exception of the G8 authorisations, mm -hmm. uh, so these were part of a UK uh, a, a UK process. If I, for example, was to set up a Scottish inquiry to look at those very specific examples of when individual officers from these uh, units come into Scotland, you would have to actually take it into England and Wales, because the operations that's where their origin is. Uh, they were authorised under. Uh, UK-based legislation as well. So you, couldn't, you wouldn't get a complete picture even if you were to do it in isolation mm -hmm. uh, and having a Scottish inquiry. Uh, and given some of the complexities around even the undercover policing inquiry in England and Wales, it would appear to me it could be many years, a good number of years before you even get to a position where you would actually get some of that data in, mm -hmm. uh, from the Metropolitan Police given how much is involved with the undercover policing inquiry. So to do the Scottish but wouldn't even give you that level of insight because it all relates to these UK uh, operations. That's why it, it makes complete sense uh, for the UK inquiry or the inquiry in England and Wales to cover these units when they were UK-based operations, which allows you then to get the whole picture and the complete picture of what they were uh, doing. So, uh, and as I said out yesterday, that was part of the rationale that I'd gone through in coming to a decision on whether there should be a separate Scottish inquiry uh, and why I came to the view that I don't believe that that was the appropriate course to take based on the evidence that we have at the present moment 
uh, but that it'd be better if it was covered by the undercover policing inquiry in England and Wales. And Ben, are you covered? Uh, Liam? No? no? Okay. Neil, would you? Um, the UK inquiry has... Um, no, it's not you. One down. There you go, you're on, you're on, you're um, live. The UK uh, inquiry has um, peace campaigns, environmental campaigns, trade unionists and others as core participants in the, uh, uh, as core participants and we see from that that use of infiltration tactics was very, very extensive indeed. Um, that inquiry goes back to 1960 and your review only went back to 2000, so that major gap that period of 68 to 2000, I think, is a very important time, socially, economically, and certainly uh, politically. There was major events took place during that period, poll tax, minor strike, anti-war campaigns, peace <coughs> campaigns. And now, throughout that, for pe people who were uh, impacted through that period, the only people who do not have access to an inquiry are Scottish victims. That cannot be right. Well, look, part of the reason for the inquiry has got that time scale is around the special demonstration squad uh, because they uh, were operating from that time frame. Um, I don't know if the HMICS can maybe give you a bit more of an insight into the nature of the data we have around the special demonstration squad that brought them into Scotland, which I would hope would give you some reassurance around how much information we do have and how accurate that is. But the, 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 the issue going back to uh, uh, 1968 is because that's at the point when the Special Demonstration Squad were, were established. I don't know if you, you want to give could, a bit of an insight could into... Could I maybe just add to that, because it might help in the answer, because obviously the issue, the, 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 there's been a focus on the Special Demonstration Squad. But are we, are, are we therefore saying that they were the only people who were conducting such activity? Well, so therefore, if they did not appear in Scotland, no one was um, undertaking surveillance against them, um, political, environmental, peace uh, campaigners here? What well, 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 we can say in our review is in terms of undercover policing, that in terms of looking at the legacy force authorizations for undercover advanced operations, which would be the infiltration type operations, that they were all directed towards uh, serious organized crime. So on that basis, in terms of the legacy police forces from 2000 onwards, then which is all we looked at within the scope of our inquiry, that that was being directed towards serious organised crime groups and not social justice groups. So was that on the basis of the, um, the records that they have retained? Yeah, yes, in terms, of, it was in terms of all the authorisations that would have been done under RIPSA, which is, was obviously, in order to do that covert activity, it would require to be authorised under, under RIPSA, so yeah. what we looked for was the authorisations within that. And prior to that, we have... We, we didn't look... Prior no, to that. So we've nothing on that prior but, to that. Our terms of reference were, were clear that's, that it would be flips onwards. That's, that's and, but the rationale was to, because that's when the record keeping, if you like, and the legislation came in to yeah. account for it. Can you also just pick up an issue I mentioned about the Special Demonstration Squad in terms of the, the nature of the data? I don't know where uh, Mr Whitelock wants to mention because he was involved in, uh, in, in helping to, to get that data and engage with them on that and how accurate that is to what we have, what we have within the report. There's a live investigation ongoing just now, but you'll be aware of by Debershire Police into the disbanded SDS in relation to it, and it is looking over that 40-year period in relation to it. We engage with them through uh, chief officers, very interested in the, the Scottish footprint for, by SDS officers in there. And although our terms of reference was from rips up from 2000 to 2016, they gave us what they had relative to SDS deployments in Scotland, and it went to 1997. So we've got that documented in the report. So we've got the footprint of SDS officers deployed in Scotland from 1997 to 2007. I have asked, was there material prior to 1997? And there's no records in relation to that. So at the time of the review, that was as much as this uh, independent investigation by Derbyshire had, i.e. Operation Hearn. They had no information, records, documents, which would indicate any SDS officer was deployed in Scotland prior to 1997. Yeah, but the issue is that we have major national events like the poll tax, the building trade strike of the 70s, the minor strike of the 80s. We've got things like the blacklisting scandal where we know that Scots were disproportionately affected by that. 
I'm thinking of environmental campaigns like the Pollock Free State, Greenpeace activity in the North Sea, um, the rise of political parties like your own political party uh, minister, the SSP, the Communist Party's involvement, um, the Labour Party, peace camps on the Clyde. Um, these were all um, campaigns that people who were involved in them took it for granted that there were people, they were being infiltrated. Um, and I just find it inconceivable that we think that these things only happened in England and Wales. Well, I, go back, I go back to the point uh, from what I made about um, what was the core reasons that drove the creation of the inquiry in England and Wales, and it was around some specific things. It was around the activities of SDS. Mm -hmm. It was around uh, the uh, work that they'd looked at in terms of undercover policing and the concerns that had been raised regarding that. Uh, and also the stuff around the Stephen Lawrence uh, case. Um, it wasn't the issues that you've highlighted. Yeah. Uh, and and, uh -huh. and uh, the, the, the purpose of the inquiry in England and Wales will not be to uh, look at, as far as I understand, it will be to, uh, to look into whether undercover policing was, and infiltration took place at that time. It will be about where people have raised concerns and issues uh, and core participants can raise concerns and issues with them where they've got legitimate reason to do so for those issues to be explored and to be uh, considered. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I've made a, a decision, I've taken a decision on the basis of the uh, information that's presented to me, uh, and I think it is, uh, at the present moment, there's insufficient evidence to justify me having an inquiry uh, in Scotland into undercover policing because there is, uh, there is an insufficiency of evidence to justify that. Yeah, uh, just final point, John, brief. Um, should it take um, one victim uh, to have to seek judicial review uh, to try and get justice on this? Well, look, people make individual decisions on their own uh, about these matters, uh, and I understand that judicial review in the UK government in the matter um, as it will. That's entirely their choice. I'm also conscious that many of the names that have been highlighted to me of individuals who believe that they were under surveillance here in Scotland that relate to the special demonstration squad and to uh, the, the uh, potentially the, the, the National Public Order Intelligence Unit um, are core participants uh, within the undercover policing inquiry in England and Wales. And as the, uh, as the solicitor for the undercover policing inquiry in England and Wales has said that they will be able to, if evidence is presented to them that relates to Scotland, uh, they will be able to uh, record that information, but what they won't be able to do is to interrogate it. And as I mentioned yesterday in the chamber, uh, should there be any issues that come from that particular inquiry that I believe that require a, a Scottish-specific response to it, then I will give that consideration uh, at that particular point. And, um, and if there's any other additional information comes to, uh, comes to hand uh, uh, between now and then, that, that will be taken into account as well. Um, should it it raised concerns about the way in which things have been operating in Scotland. For time, Neil, but I appreciate that there are, there are a number of issues to follow up on. If I can maybe just ask a, a few um, <coughs> myself, please. And that is, and, and I should first of all declare that G8 has featured a lot. I was at G8, not in an operational capacity, in a, in a capacity of looking after the welfare of officers in terms of their accommodation and uh, <coughs> food, etc. Cabinet Secretary, Mr Penman, for, for either of you, has any assessment been done of the reputational damage of uh, um, undercover policing? Um, I'm not aware of any assessment that's been made. Do, do you mean on the basis of what's happened in uh, England historically. and Wales? Historically. Uh, uh, yeah. On the basis of what's happened in England and Wales? Or? No, in Scotland. In Scotland? Yeah. No, I'm not aware of any assessment. W would you see a benefit in having that assessment at all? Uh, for what purpose? Well, I think we'd want to know the extent to which people's concerns about the police are founded on these practices that, you know, I think everyone would condemn from past uh, operations. So do you mean, do you mean, has there been any assessment made of, uh, of the reputational damage to undercover policing on the basis of individual personal to, experience? To policing in Scotland? No, I'm not aware of any assessment. I don't know where. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any assessment um, either, or, or in fact, it's actually been raised as an issue by the general public or by the police service more generally around that. I, th I think certainly the publicity around undercover policing and, quite frankly, the unacceptable behaviours of those officers um, that has been well reported in the reports from England and Wales will no doubt have 
um, damage to the legitimacy of the tactic um, in the public eyes uh, around that, which I think is why our report um, hopefully provides some reassurance around the safeguards that do actually exist for what is a legitimate policing tactic as well. One of the things we were struck with when speaking to undercover officers themselves is their professionalism uh, and their adherence to ethical standards. One of our recommendations is to allow drug testing of those officers from a welfare point of view because they can be exposed to drugs uh, and to other areas. But the officers themselves were very keen that actually they could be subjected to those drug tests to demonstrate their own integrity um, around that. So I suppose I, I'm, I, I, don't, I personally do not think it is a significant issue in terms of public confidence in policing um, around that. Um, what I hope our report does to some extent is, is to demonstrate that safeguards are in place. Okay. C can I ask you, and, and uh, this is page 40, uh, Mr Penman, the, the, the heading at the top of the page in bold letters is Analysis of undercover, undercover Police Operations in Scotland. If you then go to the next paragraph, there's a footnote there, it's footnote 62, which outlines all of those who are not covered by that. So, it, it's... Are you with me? It's yep. footnote 62. Now, um, I've raised issues here previously about the intelligence services. Um, you've obviously got uh, Her Majesty's Forces. You've got the Ministry of Defence. I don't know if that includes the Ministry of Defence to police, police as well. Um, National Crime Agency is, is relatively recent. Can you tell me if it includes special branch? When you talk about Police Scotland, do you include special branch? It would do in terms of the, 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 what we looked at was the authorisations that were, were issued um, by legacy forces. So my understanding is it would have been, but I'll, Defer to, to Stephen, if I can. It would relate to the individual territorial force, and some forces have special branches, others don't, in terms of England and Wales. Uh, uh, and in relation to Police Scotland, Mr. Whitelock, would it, would it include no, no, special uh, branch? Any activity in, in police in Scotland would require RIPSA, unless it was for national security, then it would be authorised under RIPA and probably led by the security services in relation to that. So, so, sorry, if I phrase it another way, special branch weren't excluded from your deliberations about Police Scotland? Um, in terms of Police Scotland, there is, there is no special branch in Police Scotland. Or whatever its successor organisation is yes, called uh, until it's changed again. Uh, they were part, we did look at the, all the activity authorised by Police Scotland, uh, and it was all organised crime related. Okay, thank you. Okay. Things, all... all this cover activity has to be authorised under RIPSA or RIPA, and that would require authorisation by the Chief Officer, so that would have fall, fallen within the scope of our review. D did you receive any evidence from members of the public at all? No, well, as I said, we, we did, um, in our terms of reference, and a news, news release say that we would welcome approaches from anyone who would want to come and speak to us about that, or anyone who had been affected by that. Um, that, that was not the case. Um, we've also, in your report, you talk about the single force brought consistency. Um, what were the inconsistencies previously then with the legacy forces? I think a lot. Sorry. Again, I'll ask Stephen to maybe provide some detail for that. But it was just, again, issues around not having common systems, uh, um, how things were recorded and how they were, um, you know, how, basically how things were conducted in the past. But perhaps if Stephen could offer a view. Yeah, you had nine, nine organisations in Scotland, eight uh, territorial legacy police forces and the Scottish Crime and Drug Enforcement Agency. Each had a record management system for dealing with uh, covert policing. Uh, the single service brought those nine things together. They were all slightly different in relation to it and it standardised and provided consistent in terms of record management in relation to that. Also became a single point of contact for dealing with the Crown Office and Procurator the Fiscal Service and for other partner <coughs> agencies. OK, I'm conscious there are a lot of questions, but my final one is because I want to get uh, other members in. There's reference in the report, Mr Penman, to Mark Kennedy and the fact that there were 17 visits um, and reference to the term multiple activities. Do you think it's a satisfactory, and this isn't a criticism, I mean, clearly that just flags up more questions than it answers, having that information there. Is, is there not scope to provide more information about that? I, I think where, where we were, it was around providing the nature and scale. We felt it was helpful to put that information, which probably isn't in that detail, um, in the public. But I'm also conscious that those, that information came from what is effectively the information base that will inform the undercover police, uh, undercover police inquiry. Um, so we didn't consider it appropriate or necessary to go in and look at the actual detail behind that. Our terms of reference was very much just about trying to get some high-level figures around the, the extent and scale. You, you, you'll understand there's frustrations about the scope of what has been undertaken. Would you see scope for more work? I, I, as I said in my uh, opening remarks, in, in terms of uh, um, the work of the SDS and the MPLU, 
these are UK operations that will have had a footprint in Scotland, not necessarily even operationally, but might have been up looking to, to legend build in other areas. I, I genuinely believe that they should be looked at in the round um, because the, you know, the people who are involved, the victims of that to some extent, will be victims in England and Wales and will also come into Scotland to be part of that. So it seems difficult, I think, to try and pull out and investigate that separately. Cabinet Secretary, people would be surprised, particularly, and, and you and I share the, the view that Scotland should have all the powers, that you're not choosing, as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, to take a, a greater interest in intrusion, if you like, or the scale of intrusion, which seems to me to be as yet unclarified. Well, let me just challenge you in that point, is that um, I commissioned this report because of concerns that were raised. So to say that I don't have an interest in it is inaccurate. No. Um, and I don't think it's a fair reflection of my position on the matter. But I have, uh, 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 what I have uh, taken into account is the evidence that's available to us in making a decision on this matter um, as well. And for the very reasons that I mentioned to Daniel Johnson in my, uh, my response to his question about the idea of trying to have a Scottish inquiry that looks at, from what we have from the HMICS report, the specific Scottish elements of it, which are part of a part of a UK wide uh, uh, operation, it would inevitably mean that you would have to look at the whole UK based operation. Uh, that's why uh, the idea of trying to you know cut off the, the Scottish bit and just look, have an inquiry that looks at that specifically in my my view will not give you the whole picture or a true picture of the situation. You have to look at the whole operation. Uh, and that's why it makes complete sense. And why I've raised it now on a number of occasions, uh, not just in correspondence and meetings I had with the former Home Secretary at the time, uh, Theresa May, that it makes complete sense for the uh, undercover uh, inquiry in England and Wales to look at the whole and complete picture, as she described it herself. Uh, and that would allow them to then follow uh, the work that's been identified, or the, the elements of work that were taken forward here in Scotland by these particular officers uh, to be able to look at what they were doing in Scotland at that particular point. Okay, thank you. Uh, time's caught up with us. A final question from Mark. Yes, very briefly, on the register of uh, covert assets, you've, you've explained how important it is, you know, with the eight legacy forces going into Police Scotland. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about houses or cars? Are we talking about something fairly insignificant? And is there concern that there's been lost, um, lost track of, of some of these assets? They could be substantial. It's, uh, it relates to all those things, and uh, what we're looking for is a proper uh, quality and stock check in terms of it. Everything was documented, but there wasn't any audit, independent audit of it, and that's what we've recommended, that there should be an independent audit of the material that they use. Uh, and is it the case that some of these ask may have gone AWOL and they should have been recovered and have been? There was no evidence of that. We saw everything documented, but what was missing was independent audit of that material. Okay, two final, final ones. Very briefly, please, Neil, and then Liam. Please. The pursuer of the judicial review, was she under surveillance uh, by the Metropolitan Police um, or Strathclyde Police or a Scottish force? I genuinely, I genuinely don't know the answer to that question. Follow up to the, um, the, the points made by, by Neil Daniel and, and the convener in relation to the, the way in which um, there will be some in Scotland who fall <coughs> between the gaps in the scope of the, the UK inquiry as it's currently drafted and the, the inquiry that you uh, asked for, uh, Cabinet Secretary. The, have, what discussions have you had or are you prepared to have with the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, around supporting the call that you've made to Amber Rudd? Um, in relation to uh, extending the UK inquiry. Can I just, can can I just say, I, I'm, I'm, as, as far as I'm aware, um, most if not all of the individuals who raised concerns regarding the Scottish element are core participants in the undercover policing inquiry in England and Wales. So they, they will have an opportunity, obviously, to leave their own evidence there or to make their own case there as well. The Scottish aspects of it will be that, as I mentioned earlier on, is that that can be highlighted, but what it can't be is interrogated in the same way that it would be during the course of uh, the inquiry. Um, I've, uh, I mentioned yesterday in the Chamber, I've raised the issue again with the, the Home Secretary uh, about uh, extending it, and I think the, uh, to cover Scotland, and I think the uh, report from HMICS reinforce the logic of having it extended. I'm also conscious that the um, um, uh, the previous Northern Ireland um, uh, uh, executive's view was that it, it should be extended to Northern Ireland as well. They were making similar representations 
um, because concerns have been raised with them. Uh, it, it, the logic of this is that it should sit in a single inquiry, given that it was a UK-based, or the concerns are relate to UK-based uh, undercover officers uh, involved in operations that originated in England and Wales. But on that basis, uh, have you sought the support of the Secretary of State for Scotland for that argument? I haven't, had any, I haven't had any direct engagement with him. I've, I've engaged directly with the Minister, who is responsibility for setting the terms of the... Uh, the public inquiry, and I've now done that on a number of occasions, and I've repeated that um, in the last few days, as I mentioned yesterday in the Chamber. OK, thanks very much for that. Uh, we've overrun our time a bit. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials? Can I thank Mr Whitelock? Can I particularly thank Mr Penman? This is likely to be your last visit here. I, I, I can say that uh, the Police Committee and, indeed, the Justice Committee have been very grateful for all your work, and it's much appreciated. So, wish you well in your retirement. Thank you. The scrutiny that's been provided by the Committee to Policing in Scotland, which I think has added great value over certainly my last four years of the term. So, so thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Right, we now move into private session. Thank you.